We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. We reach out across the great ocean uh, for a, a special word in your attic with uh, musical legend, great songwriter, actually the co-writer of one of my favourite all-time songs, which is, of course, Brandy Alexander. Wow. And a man who featured in a wonderful anecdote told by a recent Word in the Attic uh, guest, Chris Difford. So we thought... Why not reach out and see if he'll join us? And I'm delighted that he has joined us, Ron Sexsmith. This is fantastic, a Ron. It's a real thrill. And, and you're in as, as Stratford, Ontario, is that right? That's that's right. And it's a town that's trying awfully hard to be England, you know? <laughs> and, um, but it succeeds though, I think. In some and way. the weather you were mentioning earlier is is well, by our standards, very exciting. Well, we yeah, we're getting our first snow today, and. Um, we woke up, we, we have a labyrinth in our front yard that my wife made. And uh, it was, when I woke up, the first thing I saw was this frosty labyrinth on our, it looked really cool. Fantastic. And, uh, we also have an owl that moved into our property and he just sits and looks at us through the window uh, in this tree. And he, he was all covered in snow this morning too. <laughs> oh, you've been tweeting about it. What's his name again? We call him Al Pacino. Oh, Al Pacino, of course it is. Good yeah. work. So very good. Being Canadian, presumably you look down on the rest of the world when the rest of the world refers to snow, what it considers snow. You know, we all, in Britain, we get a light dusting occasionally. We think, oh, it's snowing. We when do. it snows where you are, does it stay, stay snowed? Yeah, I mean, especially here in Stratford. When we lived in Toronto, you know, we didn't get much snow really because I guess the big city or something, but here we have a different lake effect and then we just get pounded by snow every winter and it, it stays on the ground like pretty much from December till April or something, you know. Oh, good grief. So how's life been in the last, you know, nine months? I mean, I, I read something about socially distant, spirit lifting, morale boosting, local residency Ronnie show gigs. Yeah, yeah. And have you actually been playing some, some real yeah. shows? Yeah, I've never felt more useless than I have during COVID, you know, because one, yeah. is one thing you're supposed to be good at and you can't do it, you know. My whole tour, like everything else, got wiped out. And so, um, you know, in Stratford, the cases are relatively low here. And so we haven't, we're not, I don't know what all the different codes are, you know, like some people are in code red or whatever like that. But we're at a, we're, you know, we're at a state where we can have 50 people indoors as long as there's protocols in place. So there's this venue here called Revival House. It's an old church and people can space out safely. Yeah. I'm actually playing, I'm playing behind a window. It's like the red light district or something. Oh, really? you know? oh fabulous. <laughs> um, so I've been able to do, we've been doing like two shows a month and uh, it's great just to play. And I, I think people, you know, because the theater got wiped out this year, people really wanted to have something, a normal night out, you know, with their friends and see some something. So I've been, yeah, so I have another one this Friday, and I've, I've, I've done three so far. So it's, I just hope I can keep it going, you know. So are you finding the audiences unusually receptive because they've been deprived of this oh, experience? Oh, yeah, they're, they're so, uh, they were so up for it, you know, just, for, just to be sitting down at a table inside, you know, with a, you have to wear your mask when you go in, but once you're at your table, you can take it off, you know, and, yeah. and watch and stuff like this. But it's just... Uh, I don't know. It just gives me something to look forward to every week, you know, because I've been, you know, before this all happened, I was getting ready for my tour, the tour of my latest album. And, you know, I was rehearsing and my wife was building me a set. You know, I was going to have a picket fence around the piano and a, a fake oh, really? tree. And, oh, right. and I was really looking forward to it. And then obviously that all got sort of, uh, you know, sabotaged. And so um, anyway, it's just it's been and it's also good for me for my own because uh, I felt kind of out of shape musically you know, I hadn't been playing. So I've been. I'm trying to do a different set every show because I have 16 albums, yeah. so I have a bunch of songs to choose from. So I've been trying not to repeat any if possible, you know. Right. So you have, you you get... chance... have you had a chance to, 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 to go through the, the loft, as it were, and dig out a few, uh, a few old records? 
Yeah, you've been um, getting acquainted. I know she's been you've been tweeting about uh, playing old albums. You've been playing Aqualung and Goodnight Vienna and all sorts of stuff. So that's great. Well, that's what I do. I'm a record nerd, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have as much many records as some people, you know, because uh, in my first uh, when my first family fell apart, I lost a lot of records in that, you know, in the yeah. split up, and so I had to almost start over, you know. But I did keep quite a few. Um, but yeah, you know, I just, it's hard to know what to do with Twitter sometimes. So I just started this thing where if I'm having a record night, I'll just show people what I'm listening to. And, and, you know, I'm an old guy. So most of the stuff I like tends to be, you know, before, uh, you know, the eighties or something, you know, I like a lot of older stuff, you know, and, uh, but I do. You're in play. good company. Don't worry. <laughs> you can but, talk. Yeah. I love, uh, yeah, the other night, I guess I would uh, Jethro Tull and a few other things, but um, yeah, I do, I do. And I have a great record listening room here. We call it the back rack lounge, but it's, you can't see it from here, but it's, it's this cool sort of, it's stuck in time, the seventies room with carpet, you know, and it's got this cool uh, kidney shaped coffee table. You can have All drink. Right. Oh, and fabulous. And we don't have any close neighbors, so I can blast the, I love to hear them loud, you know, hear the records loud. So anyway. That's right. great. So, yeah, are you out in the country? Uh, uh, we're in a on the edge of a village of, of Stratford, so we're not. I don't drive, so it was one of the discussions my wife and I had. I can't be in the country because I need to be able to walk to a coffee shop, or right. you know what I mean. So, but I have like about a fifty-minute walk into the village from where I live, so I'm just on the edge. And it's right. a nice walk because it's around this river, the Avon River, or whatever, and there's swans and trees and all that. Well, there's no swans now, they're all inside. But um, so it's very, uh, it's very scenic, very peaceful here, you know. All right. Well, that's, it. Well, that's a blessing when you're uh, when you're stuck at home. You can at least go for walks. Mark and I are both both in London suburbs, which we've, we've London. exhausted the charms of London suburbs, really. You know, we feel like we'd like to go out and see see views and things like that. We'd like to see. Yeah, we, we want hills. We want the seaside and stuff like that. So we're yeah. uh, we're a bit cooped up. Have you been See, able to bubble with your friends or whatever they say or anything like that? To yeah. some extent, yeah, but we've got another another kind of minor lockdown going on at the moment, so it's all a bit stay at home, you know. Yeah, everybody, everybody's waiting to see what happens at Christmas, really. That's the, uh, that's yeah. the yeah. thing people well, are well, Apparently some vaccines are on the horizon. So that could well, let, let's hope so. Let's, let's hope so, let's let's hope yeah. So. So you pulled out a few, you were saying you pulled out a few records there, things that you, early purchases of yours. Would you like to share those with us? Yeah, well, um, I guess I should maybe start with the first record I bought with my own money. All it was right, a, good. Um, I was I was a member of the Elton John fan club when I was a kid. Oh, no, wonderful. Every yeah. I had a thing, you know, a sign thing. And so I used to cut grass to buy records and they were three ninety nine back then. So this, uh, can you see it? Oh, yes. right. Captain yes. Fantastic. <laughs> And when you're a kid, really at the time, really in Delton John, like, look, it comes with like books inside yes. and there's a poster. And, and so I would just like totally geek out on the, you know, read the lyrics and all that kind of stuff. So I I say, that was the reproduction comic, hasn't it, inside yeah. it, of the rise of Elton John? Is that yeah. the. Because I yeah. haven't actually seen an original copy of that in years. Yeah, here it is here. It's got the comic and everything. Right. And, you know, it's amazing photos, you know, and but just like it was like whenever, you know, as soon as I got into Elton John, I, uh, he'd already had quite a few albums out. So I was obsessed with getting every one of them. So I would cut grass and rake leaves and everything until I had pretty much all of them. And, or, you know, at Christmas time, I, my parents would always get me two Elton albums as well. So but it just became this thing that. So what is the great Elton John song for you? What's the, what's the best he ever wrote? I think it's Blues for Baby and Me. Uh, oh, from, right. From Don't Shoot Me, I'm, I'm Only the Piano Player. Oh, really? Oh, that's a good song. That's, that's out there. I don't, I, don't <laughs> yeah. even, I don't even know that one, but I'll go yeah. and investigate afterwards. I was going to show you this, too. My mum took me to Buffalo to see Elton John. That's the ticket stub there. Oh, fabulous. Uh, what year was that, then? 76. Yeah, and it was funny because well, I don't have the part that says Elton John. I have the part that says $10. Or whatever. <laughs> um the, the thing is, you know, my parents had to drive me across the border to Buffalo. And then, then you know, the concert was all day and they had to wait in Buffalo all day till the concert to be over and then pick, drive me, drive me home. But um, it was just so, 
I, you know, I thought I was the only Elton John fan in the world. And when I get there, there's like 70,000 people or something. Right? It was just, uh, Who are these guys? <laughs> yeah, who are these guys, you know? But uh, anyway, uh, no, I was a big, and, and it's, it's kind of cool. It's come sort of full circle in that he's been super nice to me. And we went to see him a few years in, in Toronto and he gave me a shout out and dedicated a song to me. And it's just surreal, you know, because, you know, it's just, I don't know. I felt like I willed it to, to be or something, you know. You're, you're the kind of artist he would have discovered, wouldn't he? Because Elton being such a devoted record buyer, you know what I mean? He was, he was always the guy, who still is the guy, who used to go into shops in the West End of London and buy three copies of everything that went in the charts. Yeah. One to well, keep in each of his houses. <laughs> yeah. Well, he played me on his show the other day. I guess he has a podcast or something. So he played a song for my new album and... He's just been, uh, you know, when I first came out, you know, it was sort of the UK that sort of took to me first, you know? Um, and so it was a, a lot of those people, like the old old guard or whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that were saying nice things, you know, and the guys from Squeeze and whatever. And Elvis Costello, obviously, but that gave me a real leg to stand on in the early days because I wasn't selling any records, but I was getting these people saying nice things. You know? Yeah, you know, it makes a lot of difference. Yeah. So what, 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 early what else you got there? What yeah. early records have you got there? Well, um, you know, when I was about 15, I, I really got into the kinks in a big way. And, uh, you know, so then I wanted to get every Kinks record. And, and this is probably one of their best albums, The Village Green. Can you see that? Right. Yeah, yes, that's yes, lovely. Say that. What you probably can't see is right up here is an autograph from Ray Davies written in an ink pen. So it's not like a Sharpie or anything, but it's just yeah. Ray Davies. And I couldn't afford it. I was living in Toronto at the time and the Kinks were playing Massey Hall, but I had no money as a courier. So I used to go to Massey Hall and stand by the stage door and listen to concerts. You could sort of hear it. <laughs> and so um, so I brought this down there. And when he came out at the end of the show, I got him, got him to sign it. I, you know, I'd seen the Kinks in the eighties is all that stuff, you know, when I was a, a teenager and stuff like that. But um, at the time- I can remember I, you saying once in an interview that you were you were a little bit sort of uh, uh, found the, the Beatles coolness kind of impossible to replicate, but you found yeah. Ray Davis, something about, you said there's something really kind of lopsided about him, but he sang slightly out of tune. So he was more approachable. Was that right? Well, like, you know, Lennon, I mean, Lennon for me is like Dylan or, you know, they're up on this sort of place that they're yeah. so possibly cool, you know? I mean, McCartney too, but but Lennon especially, you know. And with Ray Davies, something about, he sort of had a flat, warbly way that he sang. Yeah. And, I mean, he definitely was cool. I mean, Ray Davies was, looked cool and everything. I, did, I never thought I looked cool, but he looked cool. But it just, I felt, oh, you know, he's the guy that made me want to be a songwriter, you know, because I thought, oh, you know, he's, there's something sort of like awkward about what they do. It's something unpolished, you know, that I felt I could, uh, uh, you know, I could uh, strive for, you know, and uh, and also, you know, it's been amazing to sort of get to know him a little bit, too. I, I actually got to go to Muswell Hill Studios or Conk Studios, I should oh, say. Oh, really? Uh, Fabulous. We sang a duet that never came out of, of his old song, Misfits. And it was oh, just so, wonderful. Yeah, it was so surreal being in the studio with my hero, basically. It was just, you know, I had to pinch myself, right? That's one of the one of the longest um, longest running studios in London, I think. Conk nowadays, because yeah. you know, most other studios have disappeared for one reason or another. Conk's still there, and people always say if you want to get the '70s sound, the Conk studio is the perfect place to do it. Is that yeah, what you found? Very little, yeah. Very little has changed. I think it still had that cigarette smell and carpeting, and apparently, <laughs> you know, Bay City Rollers recorded there. It definitely felt stuck in time. I think perhaps they've upgraded the equipment a bit. I don't know the board and all that stuff, but it was just, uh, yeah. I, I mean, to, to be as a you know kid looking at the back of Kings Records, and the, you know they all say recorded at Conk or something. Yeah. It was just we, to step through that door. Really. And, very thrilling for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you a, are you a believer in the magic of studios? For sure. Yeah, definitely. And I'm really fortunate that I, I got in the door when record companies still had money, you know. And uh, so I got to record at all these, you know, in the magic shop in New York and Sound Factory in L.A. And all these legendary studios that I'd heard about. And, um, you know, just that feeling of, you, you know, you're you're in a real studio, not in someone's basement or something, you know, and, and then the producer goes, okay, rolling. It's like, you're making a movie or something and you're, and you're yeah, going. Yeah. 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 There's catering in the next, like, it just felt like you'd made it to the, 
the big leagues. And then, especially in LA, because we'd be recording and it was such a hub for rock stars, you know? So like Bonnie Raitt would come drop by or Sheryl Crow or whenever I was in LA, Mitchell would let me come by and watch him. And he, you know, I saw Randy Newman record one time. I saw him doing uh, Los Lobos and stuff. So it was just a real, and in New York too, you know, we, people are always, we were right in Soho when we recorded at the Magic Shop and, and people were always dropping in, you know, and that's where Bowie recorded too and, and stuff. So it was, it was really, uh, yeah, again, I always couldn't believe my luck really that I found myself doing that for a living. You know? Yeah, yeah. So Mitchell is Mitchell Froome. That's right. Who's uh, made a lot of your records, hasn't he? Well, now we've done five together, the first yeah. three, and now we did a few later on, yeah. Now, Mitchell Froome, sorry, I was going to have to remind me. He's got, he used to have a group, didn't he? He had a, the Latin he, Playboys, did he? The Latin Playboys with David Hildago and, uh, yeah, and Chad Blake. Um, right. David yeah. Hildago from Los Lobos? Los Lobos. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think they just did, I think they just did one album or something, maybe oh, two. Oh, was it right? Okay, yes. But, yeah, it's really, really interesting stuff, really good stuff. Yeah, well, I was around when they were doing that because it was it sort of came out of Mitchell did a solo album where he had guest vocalists on and it sort of sprung from that, I think. But um, yeah, I st I'm still in touch with Mitchell. I, I hope I would love to do another at least one more record with that guy if possible. You know? Right, right. So you've, you've, you've been on hold for about for a year, obviously, like, well, not quite a year. Uh, yeah. like most, most musicians what will you do when we come out of this will you go and make another record or resume have, the tour that you held off or whatever i'm hoping to make up some of the dates that were postponed because they've they keep moving them back now now they're saying you know the summer of 2021 which might be overly optimistic you know but uh, so i'm hoping just to finally because people paid money for tickets i'd love to, to make up those shows but I, I have written 10 new songs that I was going to say how does it affect songwriting because you've got obviously lots more time but uh, it's it's a question of whether or not you can address what's going on in the world well yeah well I wasn't writing for the longest time I mean because when I first moved to Stratford I wrote this album and I also wrote a musical that I'm trying to get off the ground um, so after that I, I went through most of 2018 and 2019 without writing anything and I was starting to think oh maybe that's maybe that's it for me you know uh, but then uh, a few months ago around the time COVID started I found myself in the middle of all these ideas and so now I have 10, 10 new songs and I'm trying to keep it at 10 you know I've never made a record that was just an even 10 and uh, so I would love to whether it's with Mitchell or whoever just to, at some point when COVID is over to, to get these songs down on tape you know uh, but yeah but I, I, I write even when I'm not writing, I'm usually playing other people's songs. I'm, I'm always listening or playing music around the house. Because you started uh, playing other people's songs, didn't you, before you did yeah. your own? I mean, you, you could do what we now call covers, but just yeah. used to be called playing songs. It's yeah. Like <clears throat> no, no. I mean, yeah, I used to play at a bar in my hometown, and you couldn't play, you couldn't get away with playing your own songs anyway, you know. No one wanted to hear them. So I would play all the... Neil Young and all those people, um, you know, and, uh, but, but then also I have a, a YouTube channel called Ron Boy, where I've done probably over a thousand cover songs just in my kitchen, you know. No, I've seen that. And you keep doing them. You're still updating it, aren't you? I still do them, yeah. And, yeah, when and, you were in that bar, I think you were only, well, you were about 17, weren't you? You were really young when you started out. Yeah, I was not old enough. Build as the human jukebox or whatever, I think. That's what this one journalist said. And yeah. Just because I was so young and I was really eager to please, so people would come and and hey, can you do learn this one for me? And and maybe sometimes they'd even buy me the record so I could go home and learn it. Oh, really? You know, but <laughs> that's but I, great. Yeah, so I still do these. Whenever I think of a song, I'll do it. But they, they're very amateur, right? They look like I'm back. I'm reversed, you know, and the sound quality is not great. But it's just for, it's just my uh, little tribute to just the. the idea of the song craft you know like yesterday i did one by ronnie lane you know that i read a song oh. that i always liked and so which, which uh, song we love ronnie lane which song it was how could you not love ronnie lane right but um it was um nowhere to run from uh you know rough mix album that he did oh right right yeah. right yeah. yes yeah. Oh, with pete townsend yeah who are oh, who yes are. <clears throat> it's a beautiful song and I loved another one on there called Annie. Oh, that is a fantastic, fantastic song, yeah. 
And, so, uh, so what do you when you were? It's funny we were talking about this with Alex only the other day. Alex, who's recording in the background here, yeah. and he was talking about his experience of playing in pubs. That you very quickly learn that there are a few songs that just work. Yeah, that the audience just know them, whether they're aware of knowing them or not. Is that your experience? Well, yeah, it's funny with me because. Um, I was doing a lot of the ones that people wanted to hear, like Heart of Gold and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't really into doing those songs, but every now and then, because I was a big uh, Kings fan at the time and Who fan, so I started doing Eight Man, and I started doing It's Not True by, by The Who, and those two songs became kind of, nobody even knew whose songs they were. They, they, almost, they, they became like almost hits, local hits for me. So whenever I play at the Lions Tavern, sometimes they want to hear those songs like three times a night. It was crazy. And they'd all <laughs> sing along. And, and so, um, yeah, but, and there were others too that I would do that were unfamiliar to them, but became kind of like local, local hits. But um, yeah, it was, it was. So those were the songs that could cement any crowd and get them all involved. Cause well, he yeah. talked about American Pie by Don McLean. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, I had these strict rules. I would never do American Pie. I would never do. <laughs> Fair enough. I would never. There was a bunch of. Oh, I never did Hotel California. Oh, yeah, right. Songs I would not do. And not that they're bad songs or anything. It was just that I, I, I was trying to, you know, steer, steer, uh, stay clear of the, the cliche ones. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. you know, I was doing CCR. I used to do Bad Moon Rising and all that, all that stuff. But um, it was just a really good education for me just out of high school, you know, to be learning all these songs. And, and often back then, this was way before Google. So, so almost every song I had the lyrics completely wrong, you know, cause I was just trying to hear them on the records. You know, I would sing the, looking back, I just sang the dumbest lyrics. I'm sure that, that you know, <laughs> but then nobody on. listening would have known any better anyway, probably. No. And, uh, and probably the chords were wrong too. Cause, cause now you can, I, I'll learn a song and go online and go, Oh, I see he does that or whatever. But back then you just sort of, you're on your own. Um, but it was really good for me to play just to, to get my confidence up and also to deal with a drunk crowd. Cause I was playing this rowdy, place where fights were breaking out and there and I because I was so young everyone kind of took care of me like if you know if the police came they would sort of hide me and stuff like this and so it was uh it was kind of an exciting time to be it felt taboo to be in this place where I, you know for the first year two years actually I couldn't I wasn't allowed to drink at, at, you know I wasn't old enough to drink in there but they would bring me beers and all this kind of stuff so it was yeah, it was. It felt kind of uh, decadent or something. <laughs> so th now, nowadays, you, as you say, everybody can work out the lyrics. Everybody can find out the chords. Yeah, you know, access to information is that much easier. Do you find does that make younger musicians more skilled? Do you think nowadays is this, does the standard strike you as higher than it was when you were twenty? Yeah, I'm kind of blown away by what young people can do, you know, just their musicianship skills. And then, but then the, I don't know how to do any of this. Like my wife had to set the Zoom up for, I don't, I don't know how to do that. But they could do all this stuff, you know. I saw this one guy, he did a t video of one of my songs where he plays all the instruments. And there's a video of him playing all the, doing the song. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Like when, when, when my band, first bands, like 14, 15, we, you know, we would all be plugged into one amplifier, you know, and we didn't sound very good or, but the kids, they really know, know how to do it now. And they know how to look good on the screen and, all, you know, all this stuff that's just beyond me. So, uh, so I do think, yeah, they, they, you know, they're, they just pick things up way faster than I, than I did. Yeah, I suppose that's the case. So have you, during this time, have you been listening to a lot of records? Yeah, you know, uh, I listen uh, pretty much not not every night, but most nights I'll be listening to records unless we're watching like The Crown or something on television. <laughs> <laughs> but again, like I, I, I'm sort of listening like uh, to a lot of older things, you know, like, uh, like you know, you remember this one, right? The oh, blue, yeah, the, yes. the blue, the blue. Yeah, yeah. Is that well, the this, second one or the first one? It's the second one. This is it? the one, the later the period. One. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah. thing is, you know, what happened was I, Elton John came out with a song called in the Sky with Diamonds, and I thought it's the most amazing song. And someone said, that's a Beatles song. So I, that's a Beatles song. So I went to the library, got, took this out, and I never returned it. So this is my copy as a kid. 
And I couldn't believe how many songs on this record I knew that were, I knew, I knew, you know, Strawberry Fields Forever and all that stuff, you know. And, and uh, in fact, uh, somewhere here, I ha oh, here it is. This is my 45 for Strawberry Fields Forever. Oh, wow. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's that's great. an original capital. So, Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Is that an old so, jukebox one? It's got the middle of the sentiment missing. Well, the yeah. And Penny Lane and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's like um, this song, uh, you know, when you're a kid listening to Strawberry Fields Forever, like it's kind of mind blowing, you know, like that's the thing I loved about the music back then. It, it wasn't like made for kids, you know, it was so there's a lot of stuff that go over your head, but it was so thought provoking, you know, when Lennon sang about Nowhere Man or something like what a concept, you know, when you're a kid thinking Nowhere Man, wow, what is that? What's that all about, you know, and and. And all those songs back then, they, they just, you know, they were so melodic and so the production was so interesting. And uh, so, yeah, it was a great time to grow up. So just hold up that blue album again, Ron, just because yeah. uh, we ought to discuss briefly while we can. The, you know the story of the, the photograph on, uh, taken on the front and on the back? It's the, the, the staircase at the old EMI Records in uh, Manchester Square. Yeah. And when EMI moved, they took the staircase with them. They pulled it out and they took did. it to the they new. They rebuilt. Attitude. They couldn't leave it behind. They couldn't leave the staircase because so many people have been photographed on it, haven't they? There's even a famous picture of the Sex Pistols photographed yeah. on that staircase. Well, I didn't know it, but I knew that yeah. obviously it was an older picture of them in the same position. That's know. right. That was the one well, that was the red. The first ever taken there by Angus McBean, the uh, who just yeah. lay down on the on his back in reception took a picture yeah. and said that'll do and it ended up being genuinely iconic you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah it's kind of hard to find a beetle photo that's not iconic now you know that's true so, so amazing um it, they seem to just have this you know everything they did they all, the way they dressed at any given point they were kind of in sync with each other you know like they looked they had long hair at the same time or this and that you know they just had this sort of i don't know if they planned it that there's way. no such thing as a bad picture of the beatles they no. all they all look absolutely fabulous as you say they had that interaction between them it's the feeling yeah. that there's a gang you yeah feel the, the relationship anyone on the outskirts of the beatles like it was they just didn't i mean they were you know they had the fifth and sixth beetle and all these people like nielsen and that, but they were really just four guys that you, they were a gang you know and, and uh the, only those guys really got it you know yeah when i when i interviewed paul mccartney last year for the 50th anniversary of abbey road yeah i said on the cover three of you are wearing suits and then george, uh, george is wearing denim so it's a kind of a suit mm -hmm. did you talk about it beforehand he said no no discussion they just turned up in suits how <laughs> weird is that i know well, I just, they decided they were going to take a picture that morning well, I think yeah, it was the next morning, the picture, but, but they, yeah. they'd not discuss what any of them were going to wear. Absolutely. But you know that last, the last photo of the Beatles that's on the cover of that Hey Jude album, they yeah. must have said, let's, we're all wearing black or something, because they're all... Oh, right. Lennon with the big hat and the beard, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. That's one of my favourite shots. I think Lyndon McCartney took it, but it's a beautiful shot. Uh, I think it might be taken... In Nurse Park, is it? Could I thought it might have been taken at, at L L Lennon's... It is. State or so. It is. It is on his estate, yeah. Right, okay. But uh, anyway, I love that photo. And I mean, they don't look happy in it or anything, but I love that photo. You know, so. Yeah, yeah. They, they just have that genius for having their picture taken. Have you got well, anything else there you can well, show us? Go on. Well, I thought, um, well, this is me and my first uh, band. I was 16. Oh, you can see that. <laughs> oh, what was the band called? The Midnight Scribes, we were called. All and, right. And my, my mom and my parents had got me this. It's a Les Paul copy. And we were, again, we were trying to do riff rock, kind of kinks, who type sounding stuff, you know. Yeah. I was, I was the singer. But it's, yeah, just 16 there. Uh, I don't know what else. I mean, I, I brought, uh, you know, these are, when, when I was growing up, uh, my dad wasn't in the picture, but he left a lot of records behind, which I was allowed to play. Like there's Cliff Richards doing Lucky Lips. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Yeah. It's a bold choice, <laughs> an unusual one. <laughs> one of my favorite ones as a kid was a song called Smile a Little Smile for Me by The Flying Machine. Uh, and you know, you oh, right. Uh, I, was no, I don't James know that. James On the pie Taylor's level. Group. Yeah, smile a little smile for me, Rosemary. Anyway, I loved it as a kid. Um, you know, I got a bad finger. The one, that I, the, one, the one that I couldn't find was the song that started it all for me was 
I had the 45 of It Doesn't Matter Anymore by Buddy Holly, which I used to listen to over and over and over, but I don't know, it just, it didn't turn up. But I did find this one that I listened to a lot as a kid, which was Ring of Fire, Johnny Cash. Oh, yes. Because, you know, uh, to me, it has come from Canada. They, it just, they hear those mariachi horns and, and just, you, you take everything literally, you know, and he's talking about he's going down into a ring of fire and you're just a kid going, wow, that's got to hurt, you know? <laughs> you know? And he just, the sound of his voice and has my mom, my mom's name's Dorothy and it says Dot right up there, which I love, you know? Oh, very, oh lovely. Very good. Yeah. So, so I kind of ran off with all these 45s when I moved out because I knew they weren't going to play them, you know? No, so, right? no, no. no. Yeah. It's, it's extraordinary how powerful that kind of cowboy sounding music is yeah. when you're when you're about eight or nine years old, I find, you know, if I, when I think back to how well, exciting anything was that sounded a bit cowboyish. Like well, the yeah. shadows, Apache and, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, and the ventures. We all thought yeah. that was thrilling. Well, yeah, but even even for me, uh, just because of, it wasn't my reality that, you know, like to hear that kind of music or that type of accent, it was like, it sounded so exotic. Even to hear the, the English stuff that I first got into, it just, uh, I mean, nothing like from Canada sounded like that, you know, so it was so uh, earth shattering for me, you know. When was the first time you came to England? Well, I kind of, I don't usually count this one, but I came in 94, my record, uh, had not even been out was not even out in North America but the, I came to meet potential labels in England to put, uh, and not only England but uh, Holland and France to put my record out so we did some showcases um, so I don't really like to count that because I just felt that the whole thing was a waste of time but then um, so I finally came back in 96 because my album was out in North America for all of 95 and it died a slow death nobody bought it and I, nobody <laughs> I was just about to be dropped, in fact, when Elvis Costello held my album up on the cover of Mojo. And that was like, the, you know, the shot heard around the world. And so, and it was the UK that, uh, you know, the Mojos and all those, the, those people that kind of lifted it up. And, and so most of 96, uh, I was, you know, I remember coming, I played the borderline, I did two nights and, and Squeeze came, I mean, Glenn and Chris came and, and they were like the secret opening act and they came and did their, songs and I toured around England with them. Uh, so 96 was really when, um, it was it was such a relief after a year of failing with my debut album to finally go all around Europe and Australia and all these places and find my audience, which eventually came back to Canada and uh, North you know, America even. So, um, so I really owe Elvis Costello a huge debt because I don't know where I'd be if he hadn't done that, you know. So that was a really a key changing point when he held up that the, the your album sleeve on the cover of Mojo. Yeah, I remember because that. The, the label was they were not happy with me. They didn't like the record to begin with, and they wanted me to redo it. And so it, you know, towards the end of '95, they were saying, "Oh, you should have listened to us." And I, I thought for sure I was going to be dropped. And so when he did that, I, it was like it was very uh, vind you know it was like a vindication. You know, I remember. Yeah. It was like in your face record label, you know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, back then you could be Elvis Costello and, and when people would listen, you know, like now it doesn't seem any, Dylan could say something, it wouldn't matter to people, you know. But back then there was a certain point, you know, where music journalism was still really powerful. And yeah. and there was a, a, a person at Interscope who was the head of International that liked the record. And she just said, hey, you know, I think we got to give this album another push and take them over to Europe and all that because... She, she could tell something was happening there, you know, so um, I just, I'm so relieved, you know. Yeah. So you're, you're still friends with uh, Chris Difford. Yeah. And, uh, and Chris was telling us, and I'm going to get you, you to You were mentioned tell, very fondly. Yes, go on, tell the story. <laughs> I'm going to get you to tell it again. The story okay. of, uh, of when uh, you and he went round to McCartney's place. Yeah. Down in Sussex. Go on, over to you. Yeah, well... Okay, so I told you that Squeeze had op done these opening sets for me. And, I, and Chris and Glenn, I just love both of them, you know. And so my first tour of England, if I'm not mistaken, was opening for them all around, just traveling around in a band. Although Chris and Glenn travel separately. You know? And so one, one night, it was after a show, I can't remember where it was, and I was about to go back to my hotel. And uh, Chris said, hey, well, tomorrow's Sunday. Why don't you cancel your hotel, come back to my place, and, you know, we could hang around tomorrow and Sunday out in the country. And that, I mean, that just 
appealed to me in every way. So, um, so we're driving home, it's about two in the morning and he says, uh, he goes, oh, you never guess who lives up there. And I just could, you know, I thought of the biggest person I, I could think of. And I said, well, Paul McCartney, you know, and he goes, yeah. And, and so, I'm, so I'm like, well, have you ever, have you ever been there? And he goes, yeah, I've been there a few times. Maybe we'll go tomorrow, he says, you know. And I, so I couldn't even sleep. I'm in my <laughs> so I get up in the, five I, years old. It's right. Yeah, yeah. It's like Christmas, right? So I get up, I get up hours before Chris and I'm like making myself a tea. I'm waiting for him to come down. So finally he comes down and I didn't want to say anything, but he goes, so, should, you know, should I give him a ring? And I, I go, well, if, if you know, if you have their number, sure, you know, and so, so he calls them and I could hear Linda's voice over the phone. And, and at the time I was in all the magazines, so they'd heard of me, but they had, I don't think they'd heard my music, but they just heard that Elvis liked me or whatever like this. And so she said, oh, we're just making breakfast. You know, you guys should come over. So it was literally that a short phone call. We get in the car, you know, 10 minute drive from Chris's place. And there's, before we even get in the house, Paul's at the door, the back door going like, you know, the thumbs up thing to us and we're waving. And he was in his, you know, t-shirt uh, pajama bottom. He looked co like cool, right? It was, you know, he had the salt and pepper thing. He was about 53. Like I'm older than him, you know, than he was, you know, then. Yeah, right. And so we went in and um, Linda was making breakfast and their, their kids like Mary and James were, were there. And, um, and I just remember I sat down at the table and or directly across from Paul and I couldn't really look at him, you know, I was so kind of like <laughs> looking at my tea and, and Linda came over and she sat here at the end of the table and she was like, oh, you're from Canada. We love, you know, I love Gordon Lightfoot and all this stuff. And so that kind of opened it up where Paul was like, oh, these are some good songs or whatever, you know, like this. <laughs> so, so, you know, all of a sudden I'm focused on Paul. And that's when we started. I, I mostly asked him about Wings because I figured he was probably tired of all the Beatle questions, you know. So we talked and he played me some new songs on his stereo that he was working on, Flaming Pie with Jeff, Jeff Lynn. But you got to imagine this, though. He's playing the songs on his stereo at a very loud volume and he's singing along with his own record. So it sounds like the most amazing thing you've ever heard, you know. And Linda's like going, oh, wait till you hear this song. Like she was so, like, you know, supportive and all this. So when we got back to the table, he got a guitar. I don't know where he got it from. And he played me two brand new songs that were on Flaming Pie. One was uh, called Calico Skies and one was... One was, I think, Little Willow. It's a beautiful song. And then so he goes, hey, you know, hey, James, get Ron a guitar or whatever like this. And so I'm looking at him. I got a guitar and I was too afraid to play him one of my songs. So I played um, Listen to What the Man Said, which is the song I was like. Uh, and, it's, and it just so happens Glenn and I had sung it the night before at our gig, you know. Um, so I played it. I'm not knowing I was going to meet him or anything, but I played it for Paul and he sang harmonies along with it. Um, but of course, at the end of it, he said, well, I had a few of the changes wrong. So he showed me what the real changes were. And then I'd heard that he was a big fan of the Beach Boys. And um, so I'd played him Caroline No. And I just remember that was interesting because he was watching me for the bridge because there's a special chord in the bridge. And when I hit the chord, he, he sort of went, yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know if it's because you passed the test. Passed the test, yeah. And I just I didn't know if he was watching to see what the chord was himself or if he knew if I to see if I knew. I don't really know. Um, so it was we were there for maybe three hours, you know, and uh, yeah, it was just so surreal. And uh, I haven't you know I haven't seen him since or anything, but it was just amazing. I remember thinking, well, I wait till my friends hear about this, you know, so. I bet they didn't have to wait very long to hear about this, did they? <laughs> I, I'm guessing you phoned home, did you? Well, when I got back, yeah, I did phone home. And um, and it sort of, by the time I got back to Canada, the rumors were crazy. The rumors <laughs> were, Paul came to visit me at my hotel. <laughs> kind of, you would have been ringing up people you hadn't seen for years, going, how are you? Yeah, by the way, I, I asked me what I've been doing. I was running McCartney's the other day. <laughs> Well, it's funny because when I headed over for, to England to tour that, that first time in 96 or the second time, whatever, people were saying jokingly, well, say hi to the Beatles for me or whatever like this. Yeah. And, you know, I never thought, you know, I'd never meet meet any of them. I did I ended up meeting Ringo years later as well on the Jules Holland show, which was also kind of a thrill. But but yeah, so I got to meet two Beatles, which is uh, pretty cool, I think. Right, right, right. Have you met Bob Dylan? No, but I opened for him once. And, uh, oh, right. Yeah. 
and it was cool because um, I knew some of his band members. And so I was out there in Vancouver and I did my sound check and I'm hanging out in the dressing room. It was at a club too. So it, he was doing one of those pre-tour warm-up shows in a club. So I'm at, and there's only one dressing room. So I'm back in the dressing room with the band and I'm kind of nervous because I'm thinking any minute now, Bob's going to walk in. He could in. walk in, yeah. In, which he never did. So <laughs> I went out and I played my set and then I went up, they had a VIP section in the balcony and, and Van Morrison was up there because they were doing a show the next night together. And Van Morrison seemed really grumpy that anyone else was up there in the VIP section with him too. Um, so Van Morrison, grumpy. <laughs> That's <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> so, so Dylan, when it came time for show, I guess the car pulled up in the alley. He came right in the state, the side door, onto the stage, played, and then left the same way. But he did before he went off. He went, uh, "I want to thank Ron Sexman for opening," you know. So, so I was sort of, like, uh, you know, I didn't even know if he knew I was there. So that was kind of reassuring when he said that. But uh, so I've never got to meet Bob. He did, he played me on his radio show a couple times, the theme time radio they had, but. Uh, I don't expect to ever meet Bob, but I, you know, if the right, if the circumstances were right, I, I think it would be great to have a chat. You know, who would you like to meet that you haven't? Songwriters. I mean, alive or? <laughs> or They're alive. Well, uh, yeah. Um, I've been pretty fortunate. Of met most of my heroes. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, yeah, because I met Ray and Pete Townsend. I've met yeah. and all those. I met Joni once. I met. Uh, Leonard a bunch of times, um, Gordon Lightfoot have met. Is, is there still a kind of fraternity of Canadian yeah. songwriters that, that they kind of recognize each other? So it's well, kind of important for Joni Mitchell to know you and... Well, I don't know if it's, it's not important for her to know me. No, but, okay, but you know what I mean. But I, I was, I was, I met, you know, there's the, for me, the, there's the, the, for the, you know, Neil, Gord, Leonard, and Joni, you know, and they're all, I mean, you know, we've lost Leonard, and, you know, already, and Gordon's like 83 now. I mean, it's, it's kind of scary to think that they're all getting up there. And I don't really see anything like that existing after them. I mean, I, I know some other Canadian songwriters, but it's, it's not the same, you know. Um, uh, and I don't even, I don't think they hung around very much together, those guys either, you know, but, but they, they were the, the people that I was trying to, uh, you know, follow in their, their footsteps. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty huge. Like those four Canadian songwriters on the world stage are, are quite influential. Yeah, so Canada must be enormously proud of them. Yeah, I mean, they're all on stamps and everything, you know, yeah. so it's like, it's a big deal. And, and I, I'm just lucky that, you know, everybody's career has a different, you know, the way Leonard came into it, the way, you know, they all found their way. And, and, and they were also very lucky to come up at a time when radio stations would play that kind of music, you know, and people bought records. Like Leonard would never had any hit records, but he sold a lot of albums at a time when people were really into music. And so for me to finally get in the door and my career is very different, you know. I, I mean, I've had a couple songs do okay at radio, but I don't have that you know, thing that like life had had all these top 10 hits and this and that. So it's, um, I'm just mostly relieved and grateful that I got in the door and I've been able to kind of build my own thing here. And, uh, you know, I'm not a household name or anything in Canada, but I think most people at least have heard of me here. Yeah. Well, look, it, sure. it's, it's traditional that we finish these chats by asking people to nominate what is the greatest record ever made? Over to you, Ron <laughs> Well, I don't know whether if this is the greatest record ever made, but it's for me as a singer songwriter. I think this is one of the great singer songwriter albums, and it's Warren Zevon. Oh, the first oh, Warren yeah. Zevon record. It's actually it's second. It's second. You're right. Yeah. You're right. There was one before. I can't remember what it was called, but but this is it's like his. This is his proper. This yeah. should have been his first album, you know, because nobody even heard the other one. But this one for me. Um, because I've been become obsessed with Warren in the last maybe ten years, and uh, just just for his whole character, his whole point of view, I always feel heroic when I listen to him, you know. And and this record, I think, it, like he made other great records, but this one for me is the most fully realized, where the production and the songs, and it all comes through, and and it's like a love letter in a way to L.A. I mean, yeah. this album is almost every L.A. musician is on it, you know. Yeah. Like, like yeah. Lindsey Buckingham, Jackson Brown produced it, uh, you know, even Carl Wilson sings on a song, you know, so 
uh, but I'd listen to this. It's one of those albums I, I have to listen to the whole thing, you know, when I put it on because it tells a story, you know, and, and um, yeah. So this is sort of my go to album. And I don't know if it's the best album of all time. Oh, it's, but it's a terrific nomination. I was only, it was only, I've had it a long time. It was only recently that I became aware that song, Desperados and the, Under the Eaves. Amazing song, yeah. Which is a wonderful song. Uh, that, that, that it's actually true. That, did you know this, the verse about, I was I was staying in the hotel. Yes. Yeah. I, I I predict this hotel we were standing until <laughs> I paid my bill. That's yeah. true. He was yeah. staying in the Hollywood <laughs> Hawaiian Hotel. He couldn't afford to leave because he couldn't pay the bill. <laughs> it's just I know, it's amazing. Like his his life did mirror. Like almost all the songs have. You know. I mean, this record too. It's it's no one's ever written about L.A. that in this fashion. The delusion of L.A. The desperation. You know. Uh, and he lived that too, you know. And, yeah. and so it just. Have you ever read his autobiography? I've read two of them actually. Yeah, I read. Oh, yeah. I read the one that was based on his journals and things that his wife uh, put together. Extraordinary book. Yeah. But I read this other one recently. It's quite thick. Um, called uh, no, no bad, no bad news or no. Anyway, I can't remember what it was called, but it was very thorough, and I was really, uh, yeah, I was just. Really gripped by it, and uh, now he's just someone. He's such a character, incredible character, completely you know, un uncompromising, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, and just sort of this. You always there's this element of danger to whatever he was doing, and like he was, you know, and the people that were hanging out with him, like you know, Hunter S. Thompson and people like that. You know, like he was such a, like even Dylan like loved Warren Zevon. You know, after he died, Dylan would play a bunch of his songs live and stuff like that. So I don't know. He's just like this. Uh, I, I always like a songwriter who's a singular, you know, guy who has his own point of view, his own sense of humor. Like Randy Newman's like that, or Nielsen is like that. So, so they're my, you know. But he's in recent years, he's really come up the ranks for me as one of my favorite songwriters. Yeah. Well, look, thanks very much for that nomination. It's an excellent nomination, yeah. and uh, thanks very much for talking to us. It's yeah, been a, it's been a delight. It's been a real delight. That was absolutely fascinating, Rob. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, enjoy I, the snow. Enjoy, enjoy uh, uh, Al Pacino. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, guys. And I'll uh, see you on the other side. See you on the other okay. side. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Ron. very much. Thanks. Bye. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.